Okay, this is the pre class video for class number seven on <clears throat> the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights and then women's rights, focus on women's rights. There's only one paper to read, which is only 14 pages long. So I'm giving you a break on Friday. So I will start with uh, a outline of a book written by John Stuart Mill way back in the 19th century. This is hundreds of years ago. Um, and it's interesting because I think all the arguments are, you can understand the arguments. So he lived before women had any sort of equal rights or any rights. And he's arguing for changing everything a world with women's rights would be a better world. Now you have to think about that. It's such a radical change. And it goes against everybody's habits and customs. It goes against their experiences. And that's what I want you to think about envisioning, right? How do you envision the next 30 years? How do you want to participate? you can really make a difference. And if you don't, <laughs> that there will be no check on power. Somebody's got to, people have to think about, no, we don't have to put up with this downward spiral of our country. We can make it better, but how? And how are you gonna participate? So if you think of John Stuart Mill, what he was up against, the other thing about it is he uses facts and he uses scientific reasoning. He uses uh, empirical science, the methods of empirical science to argue for something that is not a fact, right? Women don't have rights. Um, and so it's, I think it's very, um, he's a genius. It's a great book and the arguments are still relevant today. Um, not people don't necessarily agree with them, but they can understand them. And they can understand where a country where without women's rights, the kinds of reasoning they would have. Okay. So his first principle is that the social relations between the two sexes, uh, legal subordination is wrong and it's a hindrance to human improvement. And it ought to be replaced by a principle of perfect equality. This is extremely radical. And this is left wing radical. This is those liberals over on the left. Why is it difficult to prove? Well, because our feelings, we don't feel like that's true. And our feelings conflict with what's reasonable. So you can think about, you know, you can say, well, I don't feel that way. Well, yeah, that's partly because of all the social changes that have occurred since Mill's time. Like somebody bought the argument and started making changes so that you actually feel differently. Um, the influence of social institutions, habit, and custom, and prejudice, right? People are unwilling or unable to re-examine their habits and their socialization, right? The burden of proof is, is, as someone arguing for equality, the burden of proof is on me, but that shouldn't be the case because in all these other aspects of the culture, freedom and equality are assumed to be the progressive way to be. And the burden of proof is on somebody who claims it's not. So why should, you know, why should I have to argue for women's equality as if it's not obvious to men for whom men's equality is obvious. So not fair. It's hard to prove a negative. It's hard to prove that everything we're doing is wrong. Um, you have to create a vision. There is that romantic ideal, uh, idealizing of instinct, you know, over thought. There's a claim that what's natural, the inequalities of the sexes is natural when we actually have no idea what's natural since our culture has molded it. And then religion also has sanctioned the inequality and there's no evidence for why that should be true. 
we don't have enough psychological research. And he was, he was looking forward to a lot more social science and social science research, understanding of the human psyche. Why is it important for someone to speak out? So I also want each of you to pick your three favorite arguments. What's your favorite? Which one really resonates with you? Um, male domination was never initiated after the result of thought. I mean, you know, in a science experiment, you have, okay, here's a society with male domination. Here's a society that's equal. Uh, let's do one with female domination, just to be fair, and then just see what happens, right? And he says, this is never, we've never tested it empirically. We just keep assuming male domination without thinking about it. Nothing else has ever been tried. Um, the origin was just might makes right, which is not what democracies are supposed to be based on. They're supposed to be based on the truth um, and human nature and human natural equality. Um, it was started without any concern for social justice. So somebody needs to blow the whistle. Now, what about the counter arguments? Um, what if someone says, and this would be a typical Victorian in his day, well, women accept male domination. He says, no, they don't. <laughs> there are a lot of women working for the right to vote. So he was part of the women's suffrage movement and also working for women's education which Mary Wollstonecraft was a big advocate of equal education for women. No oppressed class begins by asking for a complete change. They only begin by asking for the oppressor to be less harsh. So then, um, okay, then the next one is women are afraid to complain. Obviously they're afraid to complain. If they complain publicly, they have to go back and sleep with their husbands. I mean, what's the likelihood that they'd get abused? Of course. So, um, so that's, that's not a legitimate argument. Um, all the causes, social and natural, combine to make it very unlikely that women should ever rebel. They are so thoroughly conditioned. Men don't want a forced slave. They want their women to love their husbands and to love their place in the society and all that. Um, they try to, institutions try to enslave women's minds. And if you kind of combine that with natural sexual attraction, it's very powerful. And women's economic, emotional and social dependence on men. I mean, you know, it's a wonder that women ever did question it because it was very threatening to them to question it. But history always teaches that people have held false belief, beliefs that eventually get recognized and rejected. Somebody has to be the messenger. Um, in ancient societies, people's identities were their social roles. In modern societies, people are individuals. Uh, in modern economics, <coughs> people are allowed to decide for themselves how to participate in economic life. So we emphasize among the men, free choice and competition. So why do we hinder women's freedoms and women's abilities to compete in the economic sector in any sector of society? So also the importance of free and open discussion. It's very important to do this. This again is a major cornerstone of democracy. It's why the Athenians in the Agora had that place in the marketplace for free and open discussion. Um, we can't just base our claims on our own experience because people don't have experience of a society based on equality or some alternative to male domination. Um, Every improvement in society has been accompanied by greater equality for women. No one knows or can know the nature of the sexes based on current experience. Women's characters are too distorted by their forced dependence on their husbands. So we're ignorant about uh, how human character is formed. We need a science of the laws, the influence of circumstances, and if someone says, well, women have no interest in politics, 
his answer is, well, is that natural? Is that cultural? You're, they're, you know, they're not conditioned to have any interest. You don't talk to them seriously about politics. So how can they have an interest in it? Very few men know the characters, even of their own wives and daughters, because they don't recognize how much social conditioning is influencing their relationships. Um, they don't recognize their women. Their views of women in general are just a description of their own experiences. Um, lots of couples, the woman just won't express her frustrations because it won't get her anywhere. So she just makes do. Um, let's see, very people know, very few people know themselves. So um, it's not an honest relationship. A lot of times people aren't very honest under male domination. There wouldn't be a lot of serious re-examination um, of what's going on. And this argument, if, if, if women really were intended to be wives and mothers, if that really was their nature, you don't need to force it, right? Just create this whole legal system that gives them equality and they won't take it, right? They'll choose to be wives and mothers. But when you force them to be wives and mothers, it really looks suspicious. It looks like um, that's not natural, that they really have capabilities beyond that. Perhaps the truth is women have to reproduce if given any other choice, they wouldn't, so they're forced to do it. Um, yeah, okay, same with slavery. You wanna believe that slaves are by nature inferior, but it just so happens it's great to have free labor. Um, the other thing is by forcing women to marry, men don't have to be responsible husbands. By giving women other options, men have to treat their wives responsibly. If you really want to oppress women, don't even teach them to read. But men want a companion. They don't just want a slave, actually, or a, an illiterate partner. Um, marriage. Given that it's women's only option, it should be pleasant. And of course, it's not. Men have absolute power. Women have no property rights. Um, whatever is, it's, it's terrible. Men can force women sexually, children are the property of men. If women leave, they can't take anything. Husbands can force them to return. Um, so that on and on, right, it's political despotism. And whenever people are given absolute power, they'll abuse it. So don't do it, right? Um, and so there's a lot of claims about um, how marriage should be, if women are forced to marry, it should be structured in a way that at least makes them have a decent life. And it's not. There's many, many ways that the institution of marriage is corrupted when women are forced because it's a case of absolute power. The family life should be based on sympathy in equality, not on despotism. And that's where children learn their habits. They, they live under this despotic, non-egalitarian um, legal relationships. It doesn't mean some marriages aren't pretty equal, but when push comes to shove, the woman, no matter how much she loves her husband, she knows she has no, nothing, right? She's completely dependent upon him legally. Um, okay, so then, John Stuart Mill did think women should have to choose between having kids and managing the household and a, a career. So, um, so even early on, that's always been a big problem. It's still a big problem because our system still makes it difficult for women to have a family and a career because it asks them to work many, many hours in their 20s. That's how you usually establish a career is you work really hard in your 20s so that when you're, when you're um, 20s and 30s, I mean, in your mid 30s or so, 
you if you're a lawyer you get partner if you're a professor you get tenure if you're in business you sort of establish yourself but that's right when women are having children and so just trying to take care of their kids will be a big expense for their careers it still is um it's it's still very difficult for women to juggle career and family um all right so the laws and social change there have to be people who um who can understand that the laws need to be changed even though their own marriages are fine you have to make laws for people who are wicked um plus you have to realize that your marriage might be working but still your wives are are dependent on you in a way that is not healthy um philosophy and religion they teach self-sacrifice but then they force women to play the role of the sacrificer right um okay so equality is based on an emotion of sympathy so his conclusion is to see the future of the species has always been the privilege of the intellectual elite or of those who have learned from them to have the feelings of that future has been the distinction and usually the martyrdom of a still rarer elite. Okay, so Socrates could see that Athens was destroying itself and he's trying to be a prophet, you know, and um, call them out. And, you know, that didn't work very well. Um, Jesus was calling out Judaism and he's, and he's saying, you know, we need to have purity of heart we need to have a higher quality. He was envisioning a better Jewish community and that didn't go over very well. Um, okay. The, un, the most direct benefit um, is, is, to pro, is gain in private happiness, right? Because women are liberated. Um, they, they don't have to live a life of subjection to the will of others, but they can live a life of rational freedom. So that's the, the key is that the model of wanting to live a life of rational freedom, it doesn't mean license, freedom to do whatever you want. It means freedom to use your reason and to use it in a human way and to develop your own ideas about the goal of life and be able to live out those ideas. And I think all of you have expressed that, that you do feel like a good society is one that enables young people to find out their talents, gives them the opportunity for them to get educated, to figure out what they like. And then when they get the credentials, then they have opportunity to actually develop their skills. Um, so the next thing I wanted to um, talk about was the capabilities approach. So this is, um, it's, uh, it's Aristotelian in the sense that if you remember the virtues, temperance, courage, et cetera. So those are all natural capabilities. And when we're exercising them all, we flourish. So this is similar and different um of course temperance eating drinking sex moderation and all those things is a virtue but it presupposes life so being able to live to a normal uh an, of a normal length being able to be healthy having bodily integrity having uh, boundaries that nobody else can violate that would be temperance. Sexual assault is a, is a case of intemperance. Um, this one is, I've been emphasizing, a life of rational freedom. So you're able to use your sense of your imagination, your, cap your ability to think and to reason um, in a human way, right? Cultivated by an adequate education. So, so you can, you know, envision a better life and you can move toward it and you have time to reflect you have time to become informed um, an informed citizen 
So not only do you get information, but you've been educated enough to sort of digest the information, understand it, contextualize. Um, using your mind in a way that guarantees freedom of expression, but also that you don't want to use your freedom of speech to intimidate other people, frighten other people, um, to, to polarize, right? You don't want to use it to polarize. You want to use it to bring people together, bonded just by their capacity for rational freedom. You want to get in meaningful discussions with other people because everybody should want to actually find out, to think about what is best, what is just. Um, emotions, having attachments to people outside of ourselves. Um, so making sure families can uh, stay together, not having a situation where families are so desperate. Men have to go to work so far away from their families, they're gone nine months out of the year. Um, there's lots of ways that the system can structure in undermining this, but in general, it's just a natural capacity and a natural right, right? Practical wisdom is the Aristotelian, right? Practical, being able to, practical reason, you form a concept of the good, you engage in critical reflection. So your idea of the good also has to include uh, promoting everyone's uh, ability to flourish. Uh, being able to recognize um, and show concern for other people, people you don't know, so you can deliberate about justice, what policies or laws would actually uh, would benefit everyone. Also the capacity for friendship, um, self-respect, you don't get humiliated and you don't get discriminated against. You have uh, able to live in and uh, sustainable in relationship to other species in the natural world. You have time to play. And then you have control over your environment. You have political control. You can exercise power. Uh, you can be engaged as a citizen in many different ways. And then material is being able to hold, hold property. Now, this is the thing I want to point out is that I think we have uh, you know, the cart before the horse. Um, definitely, the UN has the economic system is should promote these things. It should be structured to provide these other capabilities. So what we have right now in the global system is an economic system that's primarily driven by greed. And the rich are getting richer and richer. And more and more people are really struggling. So people are not able to develop their natural capabilities because of greed. It's not bad to grow an economy. It's bad to grow an economy with lack of concern for other people because then you just money sticks to money. You, um, well, you use your extra money to pay for political campaigns that, and the politicians who win, you, uh, demand that they make laws that will help you get richer, not laws that will help everyone flourish. So, <coughs> so I do think yeah, it's important to keep your priorities straight. And I do think there's a really big issue right now about which priorities come first. Um, okay. So um, this is a paper on Martha Nussbaum. She uses the capability approach in her book about women and human development. And then um, Mary Wollstonecraft also wrote years, years, she was before John Stuart Mill. But what's interesting about Mary Wollstonecraft is that she says a lot of the same things that Nussbaum says. And she's always, she does refer to these capabilities without, you know, she didn't have that model. It's just based on human nature, right? So my argument, as I've said before, is that philosophy really matters, that practical reason appears to be esoteric and out of touch. 
but um, there's the philosophy is what drives how leaders structure the society. So it is basically the most basic. Um, so the UN has a concept of the good that sustains all it does, right? And um, it includes non-discrimination against women uh, based on race, creed, color, gender, sexual orientation, all that stuff. So Mary Wollstonecraft's argument, I really like her argument. <laughs> So she says, um, first of all, she knows that denying women equal intellectual ability, that's the key. If you say women are not intellectually as capable as men, you can justify all the other kinds of oppression. Because, well, then if you have to choose between who gets to eat the healthier food, and who has to eat you know, the carbs, your, your son will get the meat and your daughter will get the carbs, right? Um, so that, that happens in developing countries. Uh, the boy gets favored and it makes a big difference. So it starts out, then the next thing obviously is you're gonna give the boy a better education and that will open the door to a better job to participation in public life. I mean, so just the belief that women aren't as intellectually capable governs everything. And so she's arguing that that is a completely bogus point of view, because if you really pick it apart, it doesn't, it doesn't wash at all. Why not? Because in religion, these are also people that think they're Christian, right? They think salvation. And they also treat women like women and men are equally capable of being sinners or being saved. And she says, wait a sec, wait a sec. Um, you have to live virtuously to be saved. But in order to live virtuously, you have to guide your actions with reason. So you have to be educated to be virtuous and to be saved. So reason must be a gift by God intended to be educated and used by both men and women. Uh, what is reason? The power to generalize ideas, draw conclusions from facts, transcend immediate experiences, um, and transcend emotional reactions. This is the only power that could outlive the body because emotions and sensations are tied to the body. Um, so if you discriminate against women in education, if you deny women reason, you're denying them the moral responsibility for their actions. And you're telling them, you know, you're fostering that they're just emotional. They, they live on impulse, but wait a second. That would mean you're condemning women to eternal damnation, right? Uh, but if you think women have an immortal soul, they must have reason. Like God wouldn't create men and say, okay, here's reason, here's free will, here's reason, the guidebook, and you can, you can be virtuous and be saved. But over here, ha ha, <laughs> I'm gonna create these women and they have all the emotions and they can be saved or damned, but I'm not going to give them reason. I'm not going to give them the guidebook for how they're supposed to use them. And oh boy, they're all going to rot in hell forever. I mean, <laughs> I don't think, you know, that's, that's a pretty p offensive view of God. So I, so I do think, you know, if you go through the line of reasoning, a lot of people, John Stuart Will Mill is trying to convince would recognize that, well, wait a second, this is not very coherent. Um, so all that means, if that's true, then every government that denies women access to equal education is unjust. Now you have a standard by which it's a natural standard, but it unites reason and faith against which you can judge every society. Uh, men are given the opportunities to set goals and control themselves, and women are denied that. 
And so they don't have any reason to control themselves. Um, children, childhood habits, they start early on either being self-controlled or impulsive. So, you know, so you make more demands of your sons than of your daughters and your daughters grow up impulsive. It's like, gee, women are by nature impulsive. Oh, come on. <laughs> All right, so marriage should be more of a friendship. It might start out with sexual attraction, but it, it develops into a friendship. And so you would be more likely to be friends with a wife who is educated and rational. Um, women's modesty should be based on rationality, not manipulation. Um, and educated women, would expect their marriages to evolve into friendships and they wouldn't want it to keep trying to bring back that old teenager flame or something. Um, um, an uh, impulsive mother, an uh, uh, uneducated woman will be a worse mother. Um, an uneducated woman will do anything to get her husband uh, promoted. Um, and he might not really belong in a position. She just won't care because her whole identity depends upon her husband's success. Um, an educated person can think more clearly about politics. And an educated person is less likely to be duped by religious fakes, right? So a religious, you know, hellfire, some guy who says the spirit of the Lord is moving in me um you know everybody should sort of check the checkbox and say okay give me some reasons uh like socrates said to euthyphro why should we read wollstonecraft well we have the same kinds of arguments the same problems and the same solutions and practical wisdom is at the root of the other forms of oppression are women capable of it or not um it's so his argument or her argument shows the power of external environment, right? But it's also the limits. You can't, no matter how hard you try to condition women and put them down, every time a little girl's born, she can figure out, I'm not stupider than that boy. How come he got to do what I didn't, you know, how come he gets that? So they have an intuition of being mistreated. And so when a society is based on a lie, it gets exposed after a while. Um, then we have Nussbaum talking about development projects in India. And um, it's really very similar. Um, she says the overall principles are true for men and women, but the applications differ. So Nussbaum is critical of this women's enforced modesty because then they're denied capabilities so in uh, the taliban is the most extreme in order to keep women modest you can't they can't get out of the house they can't get educated um educating them gives them the power to recognize their natural equality and to demand it so the laws must be made to enable women to develop their capabilities so you, especially education, if you, in the developing countries, if you educate women, they will start participate in public life. They will demand a better life. And a lot of those toxic relationships and male dominated marriages start to fade away. Um, religious laws often lead to the denial of women's rights. Even today, it's a powerful force. But when religion is tied to reason, and you say, no, God wants women to use their reason, then that's a really powerful tool for change. You just have to argue about what does God really want? That's why Wollstonecraft's argument is very good. Um, the best form of society is liberal democracy and religious toleration. Um, so and and so you can't religious liberty you can't allow people in the name of freedom for my religion to oppress women um but feminists don't need to be atheists either so some feminists are atheists to say religion is just a crock it's just invented by men 
to maintain their power. It's just like the big God in the sky, right? <laughs> the big daddy in the sky or the big hubby in the sky. It's all, it's all socially made up. Um, or you can say, wait a second, um, God created a universe that's ordered and therefore we have reason and we're supposed to use our reason to live in harmony with the, cre the order of the creation. There's, you know, you don't have to give up religion um, to be a feminist. And Nussbaum actually was uh, a Jew, Jewish, converted to Judaism. Um, okay, reason can recognize its own fallibility. So you have to constantly examine yourself. But the power of reason, it gives you this power to write books, to pass on to posterity and to keep wisdom alive, and also to keep increasing our collective wisdom. Um, all right, so conclusion is step number one for women's equality. Women have to be recognized as by nature completely rational. So that's, that's the cornerstone and everything else should follow. And that will lead to the, a complete change in many, many societies at this point. Um, then we have uh, the Declaration of, of Human rights. So this is the United Nations Declaration. Um, dignity and, and rights of everyone. Uh, so um, that's that's their main foundation. No discrimination based on lots of other, lots of, you know, gender, race, any of that stuff. So everyone's born with free and equal. Everyone's entitled to rights. Uh, without distinction of any kind, race, color, sex, language, religion, political opinion, national so social origin, property, birth, or other status, right? And this is radical. You know, most societies really haven't functioned this way. But this is, a, you know, this is the best way to function because it's the truth. <laughs> um, the thing about the UN is that the first 21 articles are very Western because they're focused on individual rights, the right to life, liberty, security. Nobody's a slave, nobody's tortured. Recognize everyone as a person under the law. Everyone has access to the law, is not discriminated. This is, you know, very much Athens, very much the Western liberal tradition. It isn't just Western at this point, but to me, it's, it's what the West contributes to global society, but there's a lot of other toxic things that the West is contributing. So um, the, I, the notion of critical thinking and cultivating your mind I think is the gift. <clears throat> the way we're destroying the natural world is a real toxic um, export. We're exporting toxic ideas and practices. Okay, no one is <laughs> subject to arbitrary arrest, uh, fair and public hearing. Um, this is all legal stuff. It's very important, though. Um, all right, and no interference with your privacy, your family, your home. So right to privacy, right to freedom of movement, right to leave your country, um, right to enjoy asylum. Right, to, um, okay. Right to a nationality. Uh, <coughs> right to marry and to found a family and to marry based on their own choice. Right, and consent. Uh, right to own property. Um, right to freedom of thought and expression. Um, peaceful assembly right to take part in your government, right to equal access to public service. Um, then Article 22 starts, this is what you call socialism, right? The right to social security, um, uh, right to um, the economic, social, and cultural rights. So it isn't just individual rights against other people interfering. It's my right to have economic well-being. It's my right, you know, to um, have a decent middle-class life. That's more socialist. 
um, the right to work, right? In the US, there's no right to work. Um, uh, the, ironically, there's there's the, the title, certain states, most of them Southern, are called right to work states. And what that actually means is you can get fired without any reason. Um, whereas in the states that aren't right to work states, if you fire someone, you have to have a reason. Um, you can't just fire anyone for any reason. Um, free choice of employment, uh, right to equal pay, um, right to just and favorable remuneration, um, right to form trade unions, right to rest and leisure. You know, nobody, the US, you don't have a right to that. If you have to work three jobs in order to have a, a you know, a living wage, you know, that's the way it is. It's a competitive market, whatever the market decides. A right to a certain standard of living, adequate health and well-being. This is what the European countries do that the U.S. doesn't do. I mean, the U.S. does it by dragging their feet. And it wasn't the original idea. The original founders um, had a very minimal government. It was very just individual rights oriented. Um, right to education. Um, and that the U.S. young people talk about it, but especially not a right to college education, you have to pay for it, right? You don't have a right. But again, as you said, some of you in Europe, you do. Um, right to participate in cultural life of, com of the community. And this is, again, the idea that you would have enough leisure time to have a life of rational freedom. Um, but I, I just don't think most Americans think that that's the point. <laughs> so they spend their leisure time, I don't know, on, on social media, whatever. And I don't know, again, there's, there's some people for whom that is how they exercise, how they learn to deliberate. I know in my own case, I mean, I go online to get news and I can think more clearly about a lot of things because I hear interviews with, with experts. So when people say, you know, the news is all corrupt, gosh, you can get much better news now than I used to be able to get because you have these little video clips. You know, in Ukraine, I can go, Michael McPhail is a uh, professional. He was our ambassador to Russia for years and he teaches uh, public policy and Russian with a specialization at Stanford. And he gets interviewed, you know, and wow, you know, I get to listen to this person who has a great point of view. So that's even better than sometimes just reading articles because you can see how it all fits together. And then they ask a question. It's more dialectical too. So to me, it's, it's better because you have this dialogue between the journalist and the expert. And it's also related very much to the issue of the day. I don't know. I mean, wow, it's way, way better than I had when I was growing up. We just had the print news and print news is good. I mean, it's also good to read. I would say reading longer articles reading articles that are like 15 pages, 10 pages, so you can actually wrap your head around something. Um, duties to the community, right? And this again, um, everyone shall be subject only to limitations determined by the law, um, but you have a duty to the community, right? So that everybody gets um, a decent life. So that's the, that is the lecture on women's rights within the context of the John Stuart Mill, the women's suffrage movement, even before that, Mary Wollstonecraft. So the women's suffrage movement, she was early on, right? And then it was Mill. And then it was, um, now we have capabilities, Martha Nussbaum. We have international development of women's rights. And, 
it's all good or it's not <laughs> you guys can talk about this do you think patriarchy still plays a serious role in your life this is i taught a class on women's issues and feminist thought for years and when the students first came to class, they really didn't think it was an issue. But by the end of the class, they're sort of like <laughs> frothing at the mouth and steam coming out of their ears because, again, it's intersectional. You just look at the views of the origin of the universe, of uh, male and male by nature, female by nature, marriage, family life, education medical community, healthcare, um, religion, the arts, the legal system, the economic system, uh, you know, every single step of the way, there's a bias. And so the image that I start with is the birdcage. So if you just look at one little rung, you say, I'll just move that and I'm out of here, you know? So you hit, a, hit one example of some I don't know, a sexist teacher or something. I can handle that. I'll just get around it. I'll say what I I'll say what he wants to hear, even though I don't believe it. <clears throat> something like that. But then all of a sudden you realize all aspects of your life are more difficult. And the fact that they're more difficult means you're not being able to compete. And so you're going to lose. So um, that's that's what I teach in uh, women's study, women's rights or international women's issues is what I do. It's not just about rights. It's about all sorts of other issues like the arts. Um, still, like almost 90 percent of artists who get shows in prestigious places are men still. Ugh. <laughs> Maybe it's 85, but it's just hugely distorted. Um, I'm telling you, you would fraud at the mouth because you don't see it. Um, the society has an interest in getting young people educated in a way that they don't see it, right? You don't talk about it K through 12. And when you get to college, it's just like, a course on feminist thought or women's rights. Well, I don't want to take that, you know, I'll take something else. Well, what that means is everybody's ignorant except the people who actually want to find out. And then they know, and then they're like <laughs> tearing their hair up because these other people never were exposed. So um, I do want you to sort of think about intersectionality, which is what we're talking about with education, right? If you have bad housing, if you don't have a if you have a non-union job, if you have this, if you have that, you can't live in you can't have a house in a neighborhood where the real estate taxes pay for the schools, and so your kids don't get good schools and they don't get educated. So that's and you can tell just by saying that women depriving women of education it leads to all sorts of oppression. So in our society, we don't say anybody's by nature incapable, but we set up an economic system and a social system where certain people are not gonna get educated. And that means they won't have access to so much of um, what they need to have access to, to be full citizens in the society. So anyway, um, I look forward to hearing from you tomorrow. Um, so take care. And it's 11 o'clock. So um, Alexis, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I didn't do it right away, but sooner than a lot of times. There you go. Bye-bye.